Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let me start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening around the world. And uh, today, let me introduce uh, Martin Scutella. And first of all, I will say briefly uh, some words about him. Yeah. He studied mathematics uh, in Aachen University, and he graduated in uh, uh, 95. And in 98, uh, he finished his uh, PhD thesis uh, on approximation and randomization in scheduling, and he won dissertation award of the German Operation Society and honorable mention at the Richard Rado Prize competition on discrete mathematics. So, and then he traveled a lot around the world. He was in different places. So he was a postdoc in Belgium. He was then um, at Institute of Discrete Mathematics at Bonn University. Then he was at MIT in the USA, at Max Planck Institute in Saarbrücken, in Dortmund University. And since 2007, uh, he has a professor uh, chair at uh, Technical University in Berlin. Uh, and he is also a faculty member at Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. So, so briefly speaking, he is a mathematician at Technical University, whatever it can mean to you if you are a student at Technical University. Maybe you have some own experiences with mathematicians. And now Martin is uh, interested in combinatorial optimization and efficient algorithms. Uh, especially on the intersection between discrete mass, uh, theoretical computer science and operations research. I think he's a very sound mathematician, at least uh, when I look at him. And uh, beside of that, he also plays on cello, but unfortunately today he doesn't have cello here. So, so Martin, please go with your favorite topic. Uh, the floor is yours. Huh? Yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. It's a great honor to uh, speak here in the scheduling seminar. I would also like to thank all the organizers of that seminar for setting this up. And uh, it's a wonderful idea to have such a worldwide seminar. Yeah, so uh, indeed, I'm interested, uh, among other things, also in scheduling. That's, uh, that was my first research topic ever. So I did my PhD in this direction. And I keep getting back to uh, scheduling every few years. And uh, so, yeah, so today I will talk about, uh, well, essentially about approximation algorithms uh, in uh, scheduling for NP-hard scheduling problems. And uh, most of what I have to say is uh, joint work with my uh, PhD student, uh, Sven Jäger, um, who just uh, last week obtained, uh, well, completed his PhD uh, with great success uh, at TU Berlin. Um, so any detailed question on what, I, uh, what I'm telling you here should go to Sven probably. <laughs> um, good. So uh, before I start with what I actually want to tell you, just a short side remark uh, on, on a very recent paper together with uh, uh, my colleagues uh, Joseph Cherian and uh, Ravi. So uh, for those of you who teach uh, scheduling in, in class sometimes, uh, that might be interesting. So we came up with a, with a new and, and very simple proof for the Moore-Hodgson algorithm. And uh, in case you're interested, just have a look at, uh, at this paper that we put on the archive. Good, but uh, let me come to what I really want to talk about. And this is uh, NP-hard scheduling problems and uh, what we can do for NP-hard scheduling problems. As you all know, there's uh, several approaches that you can take uh, once you have to deal with an uh, NP-hard problem. And the first approach could be you come up with uh, exact methods. You'd really try to solve such a difficult problem to optimality. And of course, uh, we all know methods, how to do that. You know dynamic programming, you know integer programming, constraint programming, branch and bound, and so on and so on. And that's all wonderful. And uh, sometimes this really works in practice. Uh, you can solve uh, uh, NP-hard problems to optimality in this way. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this goes at the expense of a worst case running time that is exponential in the input size. Yeah? So you cannot uh, avoid this under 
complexity theoretic assumptions. So that's exact methods. Then, of course, we have heuristic methods. And uh, I guess many of you also deal with heuristics. Uh, heuristics are very successful in solving difficult problems in practice. And uh, you, you know all these different techniques like local search, simulated annealing, uh, genetic algorithms, creed heuristics, machine learning these days, and so on and so on. So that's uh, all wonderful for solving problems in practice. But again, unfortunately, it's somewhat difficult to prove, to actually prove anything about uh, such heuristics in the sense that uh, it's hard to come up with, uh, with uh, performance guarantees, how good is the solution that you can compute. And it's uh, also most of the time difficult to come up with actual upper bounds on the running time that you need in order to find a reasonable solution. Um, and uh, this brings us to approximation algorithms, which is uh, somewhere in between these two extremes that I uh, showed you so far, because approximation algorithms, what they do is they find in polynomial time, in polynomial worst case time, a feasible solution to your NP-hard problem. And uh, the solution satisfies an a priori bound on the quality of, uh, uh, yeah, of that solution compared to, to the optimum. And uh, of course, there's many algorithmic techniques that uh, are being used for approximation algorithms like combinatorial algorithms or LP-based uh, techniques. Uh, primal dual techniques are very, uh, are very successful in this area. Uh, also, local search can sometimes be analyzed and uh, you can obtain approximation algorithms in this way, iterative rounding, and there's many more techniques. Now, since I will talk about approximation quite a bit here, let me really define what an approximation algorithm is just uh, to make sure that we are all on the same page. Now, here you see the definition that probably most of you have seen, an alpha approximation algorithm for a minimization problem, so I will restrict to minimization problems here, finds in polynomial time a feasible solution whose value is within the factor of alpha of the optimum. So in other words, the ratio of the solution value computed by uh, the approximation algorithm divided by the optimum solution value, this ratio must be bounded, upper bounded by alpha. And then we call alpha the uh, the performance ratio of uh, our algorithm. Now, uh, if you have an entire family of one plus epsilon approximation algorithms, one algorithm for each positive epsilon, then this family is called the polynomial time approximation scheme. So that's somehow, in some sense, almost the best thing you can hope for if you have an NP-hard problem. So that means that in polynomial time, you can get arbitrarily close to the optimum solution value. You can find a solution that is arbitrarily close to the optimum solution value. And of course, for such an approximation scheme, uh, the running time depends obviously on uh, the uh, epsilon that you choose. So the bigger epsilon, the longer it will take to find that solution, which is uh, reasonable probably. And uh, so now you can uh, distinguish two cases. Either your running time could be exponential in, uh, let's say, one divided by epsilon, or it could even be polynomial in one divided by epsilon. And if the latter is the case, then we talk about a uh, fully polynomial time approximation scheme. So that would be an f petas. Okay, now after introducing these uh, basic notions that probably most of you know, uh, let me give you a few examples. And the first example that one should always mention when you talk about approximation algorithms is uh, from scheduling, because that's uh, the, the famous uh, bound on uh, the performance of list scheduling uh, on identical parallel machines with uh, make span objective. So that would be this problem here in the three field notation. And uh, as you have uh, all seen uh, multiple times, of course, if you do list scheduling here, then this is a two approximation algorithm, a very famous result by Graham from uh, the 60s already. And this is probably uh, the first uh, approximation result that has been published in the literature. So that's a, a very interesting uh, result, of course. Now, uh, Graham also observed that uh, this can be improved. The performance uh, ratio of two can be improved to four thirds if you do list scheduling in order of non-increasing job sizes. So if you first schedule the, the large jobs and uh, only later the smaller jobs, then this gives you a four thirds approximation. Also, this is a very classical result that you have uh, that you have probably taught in, in many uh, scheduling classes. Um, 
There's better results. There is an FP task if the number of machines M is fixed. And this has been obtained by Horowitz and Sani in the, in the 70s. And uh, so it's an FP task, a fully polynomial time approximation scheme. So that's nice, but it only works for a fixed number of machines M because the running time of this family of uh, algorithms, this running time is exponential in uh, M, in the number of machines. Now, uh, you can uh, also avoid this exponential dependence on the number of machines. And this is uh, the result due to, uh, um, to Hochbaum and Schmois from the 80s. There is a polynomial time approximation scheme, even for the case where the number of machines M is part of the input. Good, so these are classical uh, examples of approximation algorithms for a very basic scheduling problem. and. Uh, let me uh, now come to a different scheduling problem. Let me come to my favorite objective function. And this is the total weighted completion time objective. Now here's a, a very basic problem that you all know. So we are given N jobs and let's say those jobs are always numbered from one through N. Every job has a positive processing time, PJ, and every job has a positive weight, uh, WJ. And the task is to schedule these jobs, to sequence these jobs on one single machine. And you want to minimize the total weighted completion time. And this is the sum over all jobs of WJ, the weight of this job, which uh, indicates the importance of the job, times the completion time of this job. Yeah. So here in this example, we have uh, three jobs here. And if you sequence them in, in this order here, so first the red job, then the yellow job, and then the green job, then the completion time of the yellow job, for example, is here. So that would be C1. And uh, you multiply this with the weight of this job and you sum up these terms and then you get the total weighted completion time. Of course, that's one of the classical objective functions in scheduling. Now, uh, what do we know about this problem? I mean, this very basic problem uh, can be solved uh, easily uh, to optimality in polynomial time. It's, that's the famous uh, Smith rule that uh, Jan Karel Lenstra mentioned several times in, in the first uh, talk in this uh, series here. And uh, so uh, Smith proved that if you sequence the jobs in order of non-increasing ratios, WJ divided by PJ. Yeah? So WJ, the weight of the job, PJ, the size of the job, the processing time of the job. Now these ratios, they determine the optimal sequence. And if you sequence them in this order, then, uh, then you obtain optimal schedule. Now this is uh, known as the WSPT for weighted shortest processing time rule or Smith's rule, or sometimes it's also known as the photographer's rule. And why is it called the photographer's rule? Because uh, this ratio tells you that uh, those jobs that are important, that have a high weight, and those jobs that are short, that have a small PJ, they should go first. They should be in front, right? So uh, usually, if you explain something like this in class, you should always give an example. So let me give you an example for the photographer's rule. So here's an example how you should do it. Um, here you see uh, two jobs, and the short and important one is uh, clearly in front here, as you can see, and the less important one is here in the back. So that's how it works. Now, there's not only an example here, there's also a counterexample to uh, really make the point how this uh, uh, should look like or how it should not look like. And the counterexample could look like this here. So here you see a very uh, large job uh, that is in front of a shorter job and probably that shorter job is uh, of equal importance. Uh, so this is the wrong way around and you can see that the short job is not happy, right? Good. So I guess uh, you have all uh, understood now uh, Smith's rule. And uh, so uh, let, me, uh, let me prove, let me have you actually give you a short proof uh, that uh, Smith's rule or WSPT rule actually finds an optimal uh, schedule, actually minimizes the total weighted completion time. And this uh, short uh, proof that I want to show you is based on two-dimensional gun charts. Now, two-dimensional gun charts, you find them already in this classical paper by Eastman, Evan, and Isaacs from uh, 1964. And they have been somehow rediscovered, if you like, by uh, 
by uh, Gumelson Williamson in, uh, in a paper that appeared in 2000. And uh, so now this works as follows. We look at, uh, at this schedule here, right? So a single machine schedule for those three jobs that you have seen before. And now uh, if you compute the objective function value of this schedule, the total weight completion time, you can do this as follows. You start with the red job the red job completes at this point in time, and uh, you have to multiply its completion time with its weight. So let's uh, assume that this height here is the weight of uh, job number three of the red job. And then the contribution of that job to the total weight completion time would be the area of this uh, rectangle that you see here. Yeah. Now the same for the green job. The green job uh, has uh, a weight of W2, which corresponds to that height of that bar here, that's W2. And so uh, the contribution of the green job to the objective function is the area of that green rectangle here. Yeah? And finally, the yellow job uh, looks like this. So its weight is W1 and uh, it contributes uh, this area to the total weighted completion time. So uh, overall, the total weighted completion time of this schedule is the entire area uh, that you see here in this diagram. Yeah? So the yellow plus the green plus the red part. Now, uh, you can also draw this in this way. So uh, here you again see these jobs, the yellow job. Uh, so the height, again, is the weight of the job. The, uh, width is the size, the processing time of the job. And the same thing here for the green job and uh, the, the red job here, of course. And uh, now I have drawn this curve here. So this diagonal uh, through every uh, rectangle that corresponds to a job here, this curve. And uh, you can uh, see that uh, the slope of this, uh, of this curve here, the slope of every diagonal, this corresponds to the Smith ratio to Wj divided by Pj. So the slope is the negative of uh, this ratio here in this diagram, as you can see. And so you can see from this that uh, the jobs here in this particular schedule, they are not ordered in the right order, right? So uh, WSPT rule or Smith rule tells you, you should do this uh, in, in a different order. and uh, this is what you can see. So uh, let's look at this uh, gray area here, which is part of the objective function value. The other part being these uh, colored triangles up here, right? So these, this triangle, this triangle, and this triangle, yeah. And uh, you can uh, see that uh, no matter how the schedule looks like, you will always have these triangles here in the objective function value, yeah? And in addition to the, these triangles, you have that gray part underneath here. And since these, these triangles are a constant part in your objective function, you just want to minimize the gray part under this uh, curve here. And then it's uh, very clear that uh, this is minimized, this gray part under your curve is minimized if and only if you schedule the jobs in that right order in the uh, order of non-increasing ratios here, which you can see from that picture, but which is also very easy to prove more formally. Good, so that was a sketch of the proof of uh, Smith's rule. And uh, so uh, um, I want to make an additional remark that is uh, sometimes useful. And this is about swapping weights and processing times of jobs for this total weighted completion time objective. And this is the following. I just convinced you that uh, the, um, the total weighted completion time of, of this schedule here this is exactly the, the area here in, in that diagram, the total area in that diagram, right? Now here in this diagram, we said, well, the red job, for example, contributes the size of this rectangle here to the total weight completion time. You could also view this in a, in a different way. You could also say, well, the red job only cont contributes uh, this area, but the yellow job, for example, now contributes this area to the uh, objective function value. So this corresponds to the view that you say, well, this yellow job, if it goes in front, then it delays the green and the red job here. So it should pay for that. It should pay for delaying these jobs. And that's exactly the, the view that you have here in this diagram now. So this yellow area, this is what the yellow job should pay because it delays these other jobs. And of course, it also has to pay for its own processing, which is this part here, right? And same for the green job, which delays the red job. And uh, the red job only pays for itself here in this diagram. Yeah, so you could also interpret this objective function in this way. And now if you have seen that, then you can uh, now easily 
flip this diagram that you see here. So you could mirror it here at this axis. And uh, this would give you uh, this picture here on the right. Yeah, so you see this is just mirrored at uh, this axis here. And so I've exchanged the roles of uh, weight and time now. Now weight is on the horizontal axis and time is on the vertical axis. And you can see that uh, this flip corresponds to exchanging the roles of weights and processing times. So in other words, if you have a scheduling instance of this single machine scheduling problem, and for every job you exchange its weight with its processing time, then you end up with an equivalent scheduling instance of that, uh, of that type, which has the same optimal objective function value and so on. So that's a useful insight that we uh, will make use of later. Good, so that's uh, about swapping weights and processing times. Um, now let me come to, uh, to an even more interesting problem. So far we talked about single machine scheduling and we all know Smith's rule uh, works and we can solve this to optimality very easily by just sorting the jobs in, in the right order. And uh, now let's uh, switch to parallel machines, to identical parallel machine scheduling, again, with the same objective function with the total weighted completion time objective. Now here we are given again n jobs as before, they have processing times and weights as before, but now the task is to schedule these jobs on m identical parallel machines and we want to minimize that total weighted completion time. Yeah, so here's a bunch of jobs, nine jobs, no eight jobs. And uh, so this is how a schedule could look like. So here's the first machine, the second machine and the third machine. Time is again on this axis here, as you can see. And so that would be a three machine schedule for those eight jobs here. Now, this is a more interesting problem because it's a more difficult problem. And uh, so it has been shown in 1974 in, in this classical paper by Bruno Kaufmann and Sassi that it's a weekly NP hard uh, already for the case of, uh, of two machines, yeah, for fixed uh, number of two machines. Um, later it was shown, I think this result is due to Jan Karel Lenstra. And uh, Jan Karel observed that uh, if M is part of the input, if the number of machines is part of the input, then this problem is actually strongly NP hard. This uh, also was published in the, in the Gary Johnson book as uh, this problem with uh, this number here. And uh, so uh, then in 1976, um, uh, Sani came up with, an, uh, with a fully polynomial time approximation scheme, but uh, similar to what we have seen before for the make an objective, this only works if uh, the number of machines M is a constant because the running time here is exponential in, in M, in the number of machines. And uh, then finally in, in 2000, together with, uh, with Gerhard Wöginger, we found a, a PTAS, a polynomial time approximation scheme for the problem where M, the number of machines is actually part of the input. I don't want to talk about these, uh, these uh, more classical uh, results. Instead, I want to talk about uh, about the list scheduling for this difficult problem and uh, list scheduling in order of non-increasing uh, ratios WJ divided by PJ. So that's essentially a generalization of Smith's rule to the Perl machine setting. Yeah, so we assume that our jobs are, uh, are ordered or sorted by uh, non-increasing ratios as we uh, did before for uh, Smith's rule. And uh, then we can do list scheduling on identical parallel machines in our example on three parallel machines. And you know how that works. You start with the first job in that uh, order. So that would be this one, the purple one. You put it on, uh, on the first machine uh, that is available at the earliest point in time. Then you take the second job, you uh, put it on the second machine. You take the third job, you put it on the third machine. And now comes uh, job number four, which is the yellow one. And it should go on the machine where you can start it at the earliest point in time. So that would be clearly the second machine because the second machine completes processing job number two here at this point, while the other machines are still busy until uh, these points in time. Yeah, so therefore job number four goes on the second machine, then comes job number five, which goes on the first machine again, and so on and so on. So you know this game, and in the end, your schedule looks like this.
Good. So that's list scheduling uh, in this uh, order of non-increasing ratios. And uh, it's a classical result, again, from the 60s already, that uh, this is actually optimal. So this gives you an optimal schedule in case your jobs have unit weights. Yeah, If all jobs have the same weight, then uh, this, uh, this list schedule is uh, optimal. Um, this is uh, according to what we discussed earlier about swapping weights and processing times. This is more or less equivalent to uh, saying uh, this works if all the processing times are equal to one, but the, the weights can be arbitrary. And uh, for, for this uh, case, this is very easy to see that actually this uh, list schedule is optimal because let's assume we are in this case here. All jobs have unit processing time and uh, arbitrary weights. Now uh, it's clear how any list schedule will look like. Any list schedule will look like this. Yeah. So here you have uh, one job and every job has the same size. So all machines complete their first jobs at the same point in time and then their second job and so on. And now if you look at this picture and you uh, ask yourself which job with which weight should go in which position here, then it's clear that the heavy jobs with high weight, they should go first and then come the, the jobs with smaller weights and so on. Yeah, so obviously here the scheduling is optimal. And uh, due to this equivalence that uh, we talked about earlier, the swap of weights and processing times. So you can also show this for uh, unit weights and arbitrary processing times. Good. Um, so here comes a very interesting result, a very interesting paper by Kawaguchi and Kian from uh, the 80s, from 1986. Kawaguchi and Kian were able to prove that now for the general case, arbitrary weights, arbitrary processing times, this list scheduling heuristic is an approximation algorithm and it has a tight performance ratio that is exactly this number here, one plus square root of two divided by two, which is approximately 1.2. Yeah. So, uh, so they showed for this NP-hard problem, this list scheduling gives you a 1.207 approximation. Yeah. So that's a, that's a very nice result. It's a very nice paper. In fact, that's uh, I think one of the first papers that I, I looked at when I started in this entire area of scheduling when I uh, started my PhD there. So that was among the first papers that I that I saw here. And it's uh, it's certainly not an easy paper, but we'll come back to this. Um, so before I, uh, I will try to convince you that Kawaguchi and Kion are right with their claim that uh, the performance of, uh, of this list scheduling heuristic is exactly, uh, the performance ratio is exactly the number that I showed you. Before I want to show you this, I will show you a weaker bound. And uh, this weaker bound, this will be three halves, 1.5. So I will now try to convince you that um, this list scheduling heuristic is a 1.5 approximation algorithm. And that's quite easy to show. And uh, this goes along the classical lines of approximation algorithms. So we will show this result by uh, coming up with a lower bound on the optimum objective function value uh, of any schedule. And uh, then we will compare this to, uh, to an upper bound that we will derive on, uh, on, the, uh, on the actual objective function value of that list scheduling heuristic. Now this lower bound, this is the so-called fast single machine lower bound. And this is uh, due to Eastman, Evan and Isaacs from uh, already back from uh, 1964. And uh, this, this bound is the following. So let me denote by opt M. Opt M is the optimal objective function value for a particular instance you are looking at for a particular set of jobs that you are looking at. The optimum objective function value if you schedule these jobs on M identical parallel machines. Yeah. So here is uh, the optimum objective function value we are interested in. Yeah. So you want to schedule these jobs on M identical parallel machines. And what you see here on the left is uh, this term, this is opt one. So that's the optimum objective function value for a single machine schedule of these jobs. And we know this term, or we can compute this term. This is exactly by uh, Smith rule, Yeah. by the WSPT rule on a on a single machine. Okay, and now if you for, for a moment ignore these terms, let's ignore them for a moment, then uh, this inequality, which is true, says that the optimum objective function value on M identical parallel machines is at least 
one divided by m times the optimal objective function value if you do it on just one single machine. And this one divided by m is equivalent to saying, well, instead of dividing the objective function value of your single machine schedule by m, you could also just say, well, let's take a single machine that runs at m times the speed of your identical parallel machines that you have over here. Yeah, so that's equivalent. If you, you just scale time by a factor of one divided by m, this is the same thing as saying your machine is n times faster than usual. Yeah, okay. So this is uh, this is uh, the lower bound that uh, Eastman, Evan, and Isaacs proved. So here, in addition to what I just explained, you have these terms: um, one half times the sum over all jobs. Uh, of wj divided by pj. So these terms, they are exactly these colored triangles that I showed you in the two-dimensional gun charts before. Yeah? So these are exactly the colored triangles. One half of wj times pj summed over all jobs j. Yeah? And you have the same here. Okay, now uh, let me try to convince you that uh, this is actually a true inequality. And again, oops, uh, this was not what I wanted to do. Sorry for that. Um, what happened here? Here we go. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, let, let me try to convince you that this is a true inequality and we do this again by two dimensional gun charts. And, uh, let's first look at an optimum schedule on M identical parallel machines. And in our example here for the sake of, uh, of coming up with a simple picture, we have two uh, machines. And uh, so then an optimal schedule could look like this. You have five jobs here in this, uh, in this, uh, instance and, uh, Three of these five jobs go on the first machine, so these three jobs, and two jobs go on the second machine, those two jobs, yeah, and so that's uh, maybe, maybe this is the optimal schedule, that's how it looks like. Now let's compare this to the situation when you schedule all five jobs that you see in this picture here, if you schedule them on a fast single machine, so that would be uh, this picture here. Yeah, so now you do this on a fast single machine. And uh, so the objective function value, as, uh, as you uh, saw before, is essentially this entire area uh, below this curve here. Yeah? So that's the objective function value. And you can see that, again, there are these colored triangles here, these colored triangles that corresponds to these terms. Yeah? And uh, then you have the rest this area. So essentially what you see here in total, this entire blue term here, the left-hand side of this inequality, that's exactly the area below this curve here. Yeah, so that's uh, this area here. Okay. Here on the right, what you see, similar argument, you see just the sum of this gray area and this gray area, because I have subtracted these colored triangles here. Yeah, okay, good. And now the claim is that there's a less than or equal relation here, and that's not difficult to see. Uh, let's do it in this example, and uh, I will uh, spare you the details then. But in this example, if you sum up these two red curves here, this one and this one. So if you sum up the areas below those curves, in other words, you can draw this in this picture here on the left as follows. So here you see the red curve that is the sum of the two red curves on the right. And you can see that this uh, sum of the two red curves is always above the blue curve. Right, it's always above the blue curve, as you can see here. And this holds in general, that's not difficult to see. And that's why this inequality here holds. So that's proof by picture, but the mathematics behind that is not uh, much more difficult. Good, so uh, after I convinced you that uh, this is a lower bound, I can now uh, show you that uh, WSPT actually has a performance ratio of at most uh, 1.5. Yeah? And uh, so this is based on this lower bound that we have developed. And uh, this now works as follows. So let's look at the WSPT schedule, which looks like this. So that's exactly the picture I showed you before when I explained WSPT, uh, the list scheduling heuristic. And here you see um, somehow the optimal fast single machine schedule. And fast single machine schedule, well, you see multiple 
multiple machines here, but uh, you see that I uh, I, uh, I took those jobs and I put them somehow simultaneously on all three machines. This is equivalent to saying that uh, I put them on one machine that runs at three times the speed of uh, of your usual machines. Yeah, so that's the fast single machine schedule that you see here. And now uh, the important thing is uh, that. Uh, in the WSPT schedule here, you can see that the start times of jobs, the start times are earlier than in the uh, fast single machine schedule. Yeah? So for example, if you look at, at this uh, green job here, then its start time here in the WSPT schedule is before its start time here in the fast single machine schedule. And this holds for all the jobs. And that's not difficult to see that this uh, always holds. Yeah, So that's uh, an important observation. Now, if you have this, then you can conclude that uh, the objective function value of the WSPT schedule on M identical parallel machines, so the objective function value of this here, this is at most, and here you have uh, one divided by M, so that's the fast single machine. Uh, the objective function value, and I subtract this term, I could even subtract more. I could even subtract uh, this without the factor one half. And then what you have here is the weighted sum of start times. That's actually what you compute here. Yeah? If you subtract the weighted sum of uh, processing times, then uh, what remains of the sum of weighted completion times is the sum of weighted start times. Yeah, okay. And uh, so now we know that uh, the start times uh, in the fast single machine schedule, they are larger than the WSPT schedule. So therefore, if I add to this term here, the sum of the weighted processing times of jobs, then I get an upper bound on the WSPT objective function value. Yeah, so that's uh, this insight here. Now, if you have this, then you're almost done. Then you can now say, okay, um, by using the Eastman Evan Isaacs bound, you can uh, you can bound uh, this term here. So that's exactly the term that occurs here on the left hand side, right? You can bound this by uh, opt m minus one half of this sum. And since I add this entire sum here, what remains is opt m plus one half of that sum, yeah? But now, well, opt m, that's the optimum objective function value and one half times this sum, well, this can be at most one half of the optimum objective function value because this, this sum here, this sum of weighted processing times, this is clearly a lower bound on the optimum objective function value of any schedule. Okay, so therefore this is at most three halves times opt m. Good, so that was the proof of the 1.5 approximation. Now, um, what I want, want to do now is I want to talk about this Kawaguchi and Kuyan uh, result. And uh, so they proved that uh, the performance guarantee, the performance ratio is even better. It's only 1.207 something, yeah? And uh, so this, uh, this proof is very interesting. It's very interesting because this proof of this performance guarantee that was given by Kawaguchi and Kuyan, this is not based on a lower bound. This is not based on, on the classical approximation algorithm technique of first finding a lower bound and comparing your solution value to this lower bound. But instead, what Kawaguchi and Kuyan did was they explicitly constructed a family of worst case instances and proved that these are exactly the worst case instances and then proved what the bound on the performance on these worst case instances is. Yeah, And uh, this family of worst case instances, well, this is uh, only an asymptotic worst case, asymptotic if you let the number of machines go to infinity. Yeah? So this is a highly uh, complex paper, not easy to read. And fortunately, Uwe Schwiegelson, whom some of you uh, certainly know, Uwe Schwiegelson, uh, 10 years ago, or roughly 10 years ago, came up with a consider considerably simplified uh, version of the Kawaguchi and Kuan proof. Yeah, but it, it uses the same idea. It con it, it, it's an explicit construction of a family of first case instances. And now uh, what uh, we did, so uh, Sven Jäger, my PhD student and I, uh, we constructed uh, worst case instances based on, on, on these results here. We constructed worst case instances for each fixed number of machines. So. 
we do not necessarily let m go to infinity, but we are able to, to use these ideas here and construct worst case instances for each fixed number of machines. So uh, um, I gave two dates here because only very recently we further simplified that construction. But I, I just want to give you a rough overview of, uh, of what is going on here. I, I will spare you uh, the details, but uh, the, the rough idea is relatively simple. And here's, uh, here's uh, an outline of the rough idea. So we want, we want to construct these uh, worst case instances explicitly for each fixed number of machines. And we uh, start with uh, the following. We first show that if you have an arbitrary scheduling instance, then you can make this instance worse in the uh, in terms of, uh, of the performance ratio of uh, WSPT compared to the optimum solution, you can make it worse by assuming that uh, all weights of jobs are equal to the processing times. Yeah? So in other words, you can assume that the ratios, the Smith ratios are all equal to one. Yeah? And this is the first step. You can show that uh, there is a worst case instance that satisfies this. So you can assume this without loss of generality. And this is also what uh, Kawaguchi and Kuyan did. So this first step, this is also what Uwe Spiegelson did. So that's a pretty standard step. I will just go give you a very rough uh, outline of how that works. Um, next thing, we will show that uh, you can assume that in your worst case instance that you're looking for, there are at most M minus one large jobs and all the remaining jobs are tiny, yeah? tiny in terms of infinitesimally small. Yeah? Then we will show as the third step that all large jobs are extra large. I will tell you what that means, uh, what, that, uh, what the uh, meaning of that term extra large is. And then finally, we will show that all extra large jobs have the same size. And then at this point, we are in a situation where the scheduling instance is so simple that we can explicitly determine the performance ratio of WSPT for these worst case instances that have all these properties. So let me give you a rough overview of what is going on here. The first reduction I told you, we want to assume that all uh, weights are equal to the processing times of uh, for all jobs. Yeah? And here's a very rough argument, or let's say a, a sketch of the argument that you can use. Let's assume that in your scheduling instance, you have all these yellow jobs that come first in the WSPT schedule. So what you see here is the WSPT schedule. So the yellow jobs come first because they have a high ratio, let's say a ratio of at least capital R. And uh, the green jobs, they come later because they have a smaller ratio, a ratio of at most uh, this small R here. And capital R is strictly bigger than this uh, small R here. Yeah, so that's the situation. And now I will show you how you can modify the weights of these, uh, of these yellow jobs here. You can decrease these weights, you can scale these weights such that eventually um, two jobs, one yellow job and one green job will have the same ratio in this way. You can decrease the number of different ratios that occur in your instance by one. And if you do this iteratively, then you end up in the situation where all jobs have the same ratio. So that's that's the rough idea. Now, why can you do this? That well, the objective function value of uh, this schedule here, you can uh, write it as well. First, the uh, contribution of the yellow jobs, so the first k jobs here, then the contribution of the remaining jobs. These are the green jobs here. Yeah, you can write it like this. Now let us scale this first term here. Let us scale all these yellow jobs by a factor that is precisely this here. Yeah, so we scale them by a factor smaller than one. And uh, if we do this, so you can see this as scaling the weights of these jobs, if you like. And if we do this, then, as I said, uh, we make sure that uh, maybe two jobs, one yellow and one green, have the same ratio afterwards. Yeah. So that's that's a rough idea. Now, of course, if I if I just do this, uh, then this equality no longer holds. So I should uh, correct uh, this error that I made. And here's uh, the correction term. Yeah. One minus R divided by capital R 
times this uh, term. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Now we have written the objective function value as a sum of two terms, this term here and uh, this term here. And you can do the same thing for the optimum objective function value. And uh, so let's call this term here capital A and this is capital B. And now you can see that uh, this ratio of uh, the WSPT objective function value divided by the optimum objective function value, you can see this as, well, this uh, A part of uh, this term, which is here, plus the B part, which is here. And you do the same thing for the optimum. Yeah? And now you can see if uh, you have such a quotient here, then this can always be bounded by the maximum of this quotient here and this quotient here. Yeah? So that's always true. And so therefore you can either go to this situation here, to this uh, instance that where you have scaled the weights, or you could, could even go to the instance where you only consider the yellow jobs, which is the case here. Yeah? So and this is essentially the argument, how you get to that situation. Okay, so let me uh, not go into further details instead. Uh, here's a consequence of this observation. And uh, this is a nice consequence. If, you, if you're looking at the instances where weights are equal to processing times, then you can uh, express the objective function value of a schedule easily in the following way. So uh, you see here's the sum of Wj times Cj, where Wj is the same thing as Pj. So therefore I can write it like this. And we look at this on one machine I. Yeah? So you have multiple machines, but let's concentrate on one machine I. And let's uh, consider the contribution of those jobs that are assigned to machine I. Okay, and now this can be written, just look at the picture here at the two dimensional gun chart. This can be written in the, this form here. So this can be written as this triangle here. Yeah, so that's the first term plus these little colored triangles, which is the second term here. Yeah, okay. But now this triangle, this uh, gray triangle here, well, this is simply um, Li squared times one half, and where Li. Here you see it, Li is the load of machine number I, the sum of the processing times of the jobs that go on machine number I. Yeah. Okay, good. So you can express the objective function value in, in this way now. And uh, now let's look at an M machine schedule. On an M machine schedule in total, you have the sum of the weighted uh, completion times where the weights are equal to the processing times. This can thus be written as one half, that's the one half here, times the sum of the machine loads squared. So here I take the sum over the M machines, yeah, machine load squared, plus, and now here comes the rest, the sum over all jobs of their processing times squared times one half. Yeah, so this is the objective function value of an M machine schedule here in this setting. Okay, now it's uh, important to notice that the sum of the machine loads is uh, a constant term because this is always the sum of the processing times of all jobs. So this is a constant term. This does not depend on the particular schedule you're looking at. This is always a constant term, right? So therefore you can see if you stare at this objective function value here, you see that you minimize this objective function value. I mean, this part is constant anyway. You minimize this objective function value if you minimize the first term. And when do you minimize this first term? The sum of these squares where the sum of the Li's is constant, well, this is minimized if this is as balanced as possible. Yeah, so this is minimal if all machines get the same load. Yeah, so balancing the machine loads, this is exactly what you want to do in this situation. Okay, so here comes the second reduction that we uh, use in this argument. And this is uh, the reduction to large jobs and tiny jobs or uh, sand as uh, Gerhard uh, used to call this always. So this is a uh, unregistered trademark of Gerhard working on this term sand here. By sand, we are referring to infinite, infinitesimally small jobs. And uh, so here's again this uh, term, how we can express the objective function. And now let's look at the WSPT schedule. So this may Maybe looks like this. This is our list schedule now. And now we modify our scheduling instance as follows. We uh, 
simply subdivide all the parts of jobs that happen that are being processed before the minimum machine load. Everything here on the left is cut into tiny, tiny pieces. Yeah. So that's the sand that I'm referring to, or that Gerhard is referring to. Yeah. So these are tiny jobs. Now we simply subdivide everything that is being processed here in this rectangle. We subdivide this into tiny, tiny pieces. Yeah. Now, if we do this, then uh, the situation looks as follows. So we have this sand here. Yeah. And then we have these remaining parts of jobs. Yeah. And since we have a list schedule, we know that the overlap here beyond the minimum machine load is only a piece of one job on every machine yeah, because it's a list schedule. And uh, now you can see that uh, doing this, what I just did, so cutting these uh, pieces of jobs into tiny pieces, uh, making the sand, this leaves the sum of squared machine loads unchanged. Yeah, So the machine loads didn't change in that picture, as you could see. Yeah. The only thing I changed was this part here, because for, for all the jobs that, that occurred here, here, now I, I cut them into tiny pieces. So essentially, I reduced the sum of these tiny pieces here of their uh, size squared. I decreased this to zero. Yeah. So therefore, uh, this term here in the objective function has been decreased by some amount, by some amount delta. Yeah, that happened in the WSPT schedule. In the optimum schedule, well, almost the same thing happened. So either the machine loads squared remained unchanged, or it could have even been decreased. Yeah, so that could have happened. But in any case, this term has been decreased by the same amount delta that we discussed here. Yeah. So therefore, if you uh, take the ratio of WSPT divided by opt, then you see that uh, this has been decreased here by delta, and it has been decreased here by at least delta, maybe more. Yeah? So therefore, the ratio of WSPT divided by opt has increased. Yeah? So that's uh, what I say here. This has uh, increased or, or could be unchanged, yeah? but uh, has definitely not decreased. So that's why the second reduction is OK. Let me come to the third reduction. I promise to make the large jobs extra large. Now, what do I mean by this? So here's again the picture of our WSPT schedule. You see here's uh, this sand that we discussed, and then there's the overlapping uh, jobs that you see here, one job per machine at most. Yeah? And uh, so now let's look at the optimum schedule. And I told you the optimum schedule in this uh, situation tries to balance the machine loads as far as possible. And that's now easy if you have this sand here and you have few big jobs because you can balance the machine loads as much as possible by simply starting all the large jobs at time zero and then filling in the sand yeah, to balance these machines as far as you can. So therefore now you know the optimum schedule must look like this picture here. Good. Now, the idea is that we will uh, modify these jobs that lie in the sand on, in the optimum schedule. Yeah? So these green jobs here. I will leave these red jobs, un red, red jobs unchanged. Yeah? So they overlap here. They overlap the sand. So they will remain unchanged. But those green ones I will change. And I will change them in such a way that I distribute the total processing time of these green jobs in a different way. I uh, create as uh, many large jobs as possible, whose size is uh, exactly the level of the sand here in the schedule, and then something might remain. Yeah, so that's this uh, transformation. I take this entire green processing time here and I redistribute it to jobs in such a way. Now, in the uh, WSPT schedule, the situation then looks like this. So here are the same green jobs that we have here now. So that would be our new scheduling instance. And now you can show, and I will not go into details, you can show that doing this operation, this increases the objective function value here on that side by this term, whatever that is, it's some non-negative term. So the objective function value has increased here. Yeah? So opt is more expensive now. 
but you can show that here on the on the left hand side for the WSPT schedule, this objective function value has also increased compared to the old one, but it has increased by this term, which is twice this term. Yeah. So WSPT has increased by twice as much as opt. And since we know that this ratio is bounded by three halves anyway, increasing this by twice as much as this certainly gives you a worse ratio than you had before. So that's why that third reduction here is okay. Good. Finally, um, yeah, so that was uh, this argument. Finally, let's come to the fourth reduction. And this is uh, making all extra large jobs. So the red jobs that remain in this picture now, making them all have the same size. Now, if you do this, if you redistribute the red processing time that you see here in this picture, such that all red jobs have the same size now. So the property is that the total processing time that you see here, the total red area is the same as here. That's the idea. So if you redistribute it in this way, you can show that for the optimal schedule compared to the WSBT schedule, the following happens. So the increase in the objective is in this case, non-positive. So you actually decrease the optimal objective function value by this amount. And you can show that you decrease the WSPT objective function value by exactly the same amount. Yeah. So if you look at the quotient of WSPT divided by opt and you decrease both by the same amount, then you know that this ratio can only increase. So that's why uh, we have now really found a worst case instance that looks like this in the optimum solution and like this in the WSPT solution. Good. Now this can be analyzed. So uh, since uh, this is a very simple structure, as you can see, so there's only few parameters that remain. There is the number of uh, red jobs that is denoted by K. Yeah, K is the number of red jobs. There is the size of the red jobs. Yeah, and uh, we can uh, we can somehow uh, scale things such that we, that we say the amount of sand that we have, the total processing time of the sand that we have is number of machines m times one. Yeah, so this is just a scaling uh, argument. Good. And if we do this, we can now uh, determine the uh, objective function value of the WSPT schedule, which is this term. Let me not go into the details. This is uh, can easily be determined from that picture. And the same for the optimal schedule, which is uh, this term. Then you can uh, do. Then you can compute the ratio. Yeah, WSPT divided by opt, which is uh, this nice term here. Yeah, which looks a little ugly, but can be analyzed easily. In particular, what you can show is that if you fix the number of machines M and you fix the number of extra large jobs, which is K, then the worst case size of the extra large jobs, which is X, this worst case size is uh, obtained here for this value. Yeah, so that's just a basic calculus that you can do on this quotient here. Yeah, so you determine the worst case size of your extra large jobs, which is this term. You block this in into this quotient here, and all that remains now as unknowns is m, the number of machines, and k, the number of uh, extra large jobs. And uh, so you can see now that if you fix m, if you consider a fixed number of machines, then the worst case performance that you're looking for is just the maximum over all possible values of K, which is the number of extra large jobs of this term here. Yeah? So it simplifies to, to this. Now you can look at, the, at this function here and uh, here are some pictures, but let me show you the crucial picture. So first of all, you can, uh, you can easily see that the maximum uh, the maximum uh, in terms of uh, what uh, value of K is, is the maximum here for this term here. This can be easily determined. So K is, uh, is this number here rounded to the next integer. That's what you see here, yeah? rounded to the next integer. And uh, then you get this picture here. So here on the horizontal axis, you have the number of machines. This is the number of machines M. And here on the vertical axis, you have that worst case performance ratio of the WSPT schedule. So you see that asymptotically, 
this uh, reaches uh, this bound of uh, one plus square root of two divided by two. That's the Kawaguchi and Kuyan bound. But for each particular number of machines, you get a slightly smaller bound. So for example, for five machines, you have a considerably smaller number here, which is 1.2. And for only two machines, you have, a, of course, a smaller number and so on. Yeah, so you can uh, compute this now explicitly. Good. So, um, you can also do something similar for stochastic scheduling. Since my time is almost up, let me not go into details here. I just uh, tell you the, the following result that uh, we obtained. So, uh, so that's this result. If you generalize the WSPT rule to a stochastic scheduling problem, then uh, you're talking about the weighted shortest expected processing time rule, WSEPT rule. And uh, we can analyze this uh, with similar ideas and proof that in stochastic scheduling, you get this performance bound here. But let me not go into details here. Let me skip this. Let me instead conclude with one open problem that I find very interesting and that hopefully some of you find interesting as well. And this is an online variant of the deterministic machine scheduling problem that we studied now. And this is the online variant where we assume that the jobs arrive one by one and they must always be immediately assigned to a machine. And then on each machine, all the assigned jobs are optimally sequenced. Yeah? On each machine, all the jobs that you assign to this machine, they are being scheduled according to Smith's rule or the WSPT. Yeah? Okay, so that's the problem. It's an online problem. You get the jobs one by one, and you always have to decide to which machine should I assign this job? Now, this is a very natural greedy algorithm that you might want to use in this online setting. That's the min increase algorithm. Whenever you add a new job, you put it on the machine where it increases the objective function value by the smallest possible amount. Yeah? That's the min increase algorithm. Now, that's essentially what uh, WSPT does if you get the jobs in the right order, in the WSPT order, in the Smith's ratio order. Yeah? And uh, we do this in a more general setting. No matter in which sequence we get the jobs, we use this min increase algorithm. Now, it can be shown, and that's similar to what I showed you earlier, this 1.5 performance ratio of WSPT. This uh, can be generalized to that setting. So you can show that you get this performance ratio, this competitive ratio in this online scheduling problem. And uh, the open problem is, um, can you really also achieve this Kawaguchi Q unbound? Well, we know that if the jobs arrive in the right order, in order of non-increasing or even in order of non-decreasing Smith ratios, then we get this competitive ratio here. In general, we do not know, and this has been conjectured by Lien Stauchi, and uh, I think uh, some of uh, the members of the audience have worked on this. It has been conjectured that the, the right answer here for the competitive ratio should be the Kawaguchi and Q unbound, but... Unfortunately, no one was able to prove this yet. Okay, so here's uh, some references of uh, papers I mentioned in the talk. I thank you all very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions if in case there are any. Okay, so thank you, Martin, it was really nice. And I would like to open uh, the questions now. So you should be able to unmute yourself. So you can either uh, say your question directly or you can write it in the chat right so so if nobody wants to start then i will ask a difficult I question Martin. Uh, i would like to start yeah go ahead okay thank you very much i'm sorry for pushing uh but nobody else wanted to so uh martin uh i have been interested in many scheduling problems, as you are probably aware of. Uh, my question here is for your, uh, the cases that you have been looking at, um, you didn't include precedence constraints. Now, uh, it would be unfair to just add precedence constraints now. So let's make it easier and say, what if we have uh, you know equal weights, equal processing times, but just precedence constraints? What what is the situation uh, in terms of your work? 
Well, if you have precedence constraints in addition, of course, this is, uh, I mean, as you pointed out, this is classical uh, constraints that you uh, that you observe in many, many scheduling settings. And uh, also, in, also for these more general problems that you mentioned, uh, there is, of course, a fair amount of work on, on approximation algorithms. Now, for the particular problem you were referring to, let's assume all the weights and all the processing times are equal, then just doing a, like a greedy algorithm, just greedily scheduling your jobs, of course, in some uh, order that is compatible with the precedence constraints. This will always give you, uh, this will always give you an, uh, well, is that true? No, three halves, the, uh, the hamper. The... Sorry, I didn't. There's the, the, the hamper, three halves. Yeah, so that, that should definitely be possible. I guess yeah, you yeah, can... yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you you can uh, well you and can for, for uh, sorry this for two plus uh, one uh, minus one of uh, one one plus one over m I think or something like that uh, for m processes sorry yeah but I mean there, there there are approximation results for for the more general case where you have processing times you have it's weights and so on. And this can all be, this can can also be approximated with uh, with constant performance guarantees. So that's yeah, Mike. I, would you like to continue? I, I have a question, uh, Martin. I've read your results on the WSEPT. Uh, I think it's part of your PhD thesis, and you come up with bounds for the stochastic counterparts of this problem. Very interesting, the bounds and the proof. I think it was with Ralph Murray. Um, the only thing what is slightly puzzling is the following. Your bounds depend on the variance of the processing time distribution. And the more, the larger the variability in the processing time distributions, the worse you can get. Now, there is the stochastic people, and I'm a little bit more stochastic than I'm deterministic. We have the general rule or the general intuition that when you make a deterministic problem stochastic, then the rule that was not optimal in the deterministic problem may become optimal in the stochastic problem. Not only that, if you have a rule that has a certain worst case bound in the deterministic one, you have a counterpart, a stochastic counterpart, you think that that worst case bound will get closer to one. And actually, it will get closer to one if the variance gets larger. You feel now sort of where my question is. So your result was actually a little bit counterintuitive. And actually, I spent actually, this was maybe 10 years ago. I spent actually a fair amount of time on the, on the murring Scutella paper, which is a fascinating paper. Now, the question actually is, do you have for the bounds uh, for the stochastic case, do you have actually instances that you can show that they are tight? And I would be interested in instances where all the processing times of the jobs comes from the same distribution family. Do you, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, yes. So first of all, I, I should mention, I, I guess the, the, the results you're referring to, they, they, I wasn't involved in that. So that was by Rolf uh, together with Andreas and, and Mark, uh, Rolf Möhring, uh, Andreas Schulz and, and Mark Oetz. So that's, uh, that was somehow the, the first paper, I guess, on approximation algorithms for stochastic scheduling. And indeed, so here's what, what you were referring to. Here's this a number delta, which is an upper bound on the squared coefficient of variation that goes into the performance ratio that you see here. Yeah? And uh, indeed, I, I know what you mean. So the, the, the bigger this uh, squared coefficient of variation gets, um, the worse is the performance ratio that, uh, that was obtained here in, in this uh, classical paper by, by those three guys. But uh, as you see, also in, in, the, in the more recent results that we obtained, there's still this delta here. So it's the same, it's the same effect that you mentioned. Now, <laughs> you're, you're asking why is that? And why, why is it getting worse if, if delta is bigger? Uh, well, I, I don't have a, 
really good answer on that. But so so there is certain difficulties that come with uh, with a high uh, number delta. And one difficulty that we observe that makes the stochastic scheduling problem considerably more difficult than the deterministic one is the following effect. It can happen that, uh, well, in deterministic scheduling, we know that if you get more machines, if you get twice as many machines, uh, then your objective fun function value will, will uh, certainly decrease. And, and uh, this holds uh, also for list scheduling. In stochastic scheduling, um, there is no longer such a nice relationship between number of machines that you have to schedule your jobs and uh, the objective function value that you can uh, obtain. So in stochastic scheduling, it, it can happen to you that just getting one more machine on which you can do something very risky in, in, the, stochastic, uh, in the stochastic case. So let's say schedule a job that might become huge with a very small probability. So getting this one additional machine helps you a lot in, 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 uh, in stochastic scheduling. And that's, that's what makes the, the problem so difficult to analyze for us from the worst case perspective. So in, 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 this, uh, in this stochastic scheduling and approximation algorithms community, as you, as you uh, point out, this, this is one of the big questions. Can we avoid this dependence on Delta here? Can we uh, somehow uh, get down to something more reasonable, but there are negative results. And I mentioned some of those here. So there are negative results in the sense that WSEPT has no constant performance ratio. So you cannot avoid to have uh, a certain dependence on Delta. For every fixed Delta, of course, you can say this is a constant, but uh, in the overall, there is no constant performance ratio. And, and uh, you might want to have a look at, at, the, at these works that I mentioned here. And uh, there, there, you can, uh, there you can get these lower bounds that show that unfortunately in our setting, we cannot avoid uh, this dependence here. I hope okay. this yeah. is a partial answer to, to your question. No, no. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. yeah. That's a good answer. Good answer. Yeah, Martin, back to the precedence constraints. So, so your symmetry that you have shown between processing time and weight of, of the task doesn't apply anymore in the case of precedence constraints because they have to follow, let's say, time axis, uh, right? So, yeah. So, but if the weights are and processing times are identical, then it's sort of symmetric and then it seems to be easier. It relates to the question asked by Ernst, right? Yeah, so I, I think this, uh, this symmetry between processing times and weights, um, this partly holds also for, for presence constraint scheduling. I mean, essentially this, this symmetry just says, uh, you can uh, read the schedule forwards or you can read it backwards. And uh, so this symmetry be between forwards and backwards, that's essentially what is behind that uh, weight processing time symmetry. And this can also be done in, uh, with precedence constraints. I mean, the, the entire situation is not as easy because there you might have holes due to uh, the precedence constraints. So you have idle time on a machine and so on. So that makes the situation a little more complicated. May I add something? Any? Okay. Uh, this is just prompted by what Martin just said. Uh, I agree. Uh, I have been looking at um, probabilistic randomized scheduling with precedence constraints, and uh, there is not too much in the literature uh, for a certain number, say uh, limited number M machines. Uh, there are some partial results for two identical machines, uh, in particular for trees. And uh, what I've been looking at uh, lately is uh, looking at the opposite case, which is out trees. Uh, 
so sorry, trees might have been misleading now. This was, uh, so, so I'm, I've been looking at out trees and it turns out that all, all now is uh, sort of, yeah, well, uh, don't take it too serious, but all the things we have been looking at, all the uh, routines, all uh, the paradigms that we have been looking at, it, all that have been looking at in general, I would say, are not optimal. They don't work in general. So uh, to me, it also looks like a tough, open question, but I cannot say, I don't want to say more because uh, I have to write this up and things like that. Uh, but right now it is just my opinion uh, that uh, this thing that is uh, stochastic scheduling, even with the simplest assumptions on uh, the distributions, uh, is very tough and it actually does not, and this is a little bit uh, maybe a, uh, along what you said, Martin, it does not behave like what we would expect in the deterministic uh, world. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm not sure whether I can say something meaningful about that, but that's that's a very interesting remark. Yeah, thank you, Ernst. All right. So, are there any other questions? Yeah, maybe maybe not a question, but a comment. Uh, so, this is Mark. So, uh, coming back to what Mike uh, was asking. So, this is indeed a fascinating thing. And one more remark, maybe. So, if you look at the worst case bound that what Martin was mentioning on the WSPT. Um, or SEPT rule, um, you would probably hope that you can get below the Kawaguchi Q unbound, um, say, if you assume exponentially distributed processing times, right? Um, but in fact, it's reverse. Uh, so the, the uh, uh, WSEPT rule for exponentially distributed processing times is even larger than this Kawaguchi Q unbound, whereas you would hope, or would have hoped, it would be in the other direction. Right. Did you find uh, actually an instance? Did you find an yeah. instance that it's, it's larger? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's only slightly larger. Uh, it's exactly Kawaguchi and Kuyan's uh, instance. Uh, just when you do the analysis right, you see that the performance count bound is worse than this one point two one. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I can. Uh, so for, with exponentials. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Well, when, when we looked at this back then with a student, uh, it we were hoping to prove something better, actually. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. It's exactly what you were describing, and I can only confirm what Martin said. I mean, this is the annoying thing in all the analysis that we have been doing in stochastic scheduling so far, yeah. Okay, one, one challenging question in the chat, right? You mean the PNP question? <laughs> scheduling, whether scheduling will be the domain which will, which will show examples that will prove it or not. No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, so some other questions? Okay. If this okay, you may want to make an announcement for next week, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. For, for next week and uh, for two weeks from now. So it's uh, Eric, I think. So, so so next week, it means uh, May 26th, uh, we will have uh, Eric uh, de Mellemester speaking uh, about uh, reactive and proactive uh, project scheduling. And then two weeks later, we will have uh, Jinjiang Wuan, and uh, he will speak about complexity results in single machine uh, primary, secondary scheduling, okay? So these are the two talks uh, uh, that follow. And then we have uh, Mike Carter, and finally, Andrea Scherf. Uh, and uh, this is probably all that we will have before, uh, before uh, holidays. 
And uh, next uh, Wednesday, we should have a PC committee meeting. Uh, so I hope that this meeting, we will prepare program for like uh, nearly upcoming year. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what will follow. Do you have any questions or comments? If not, so let me close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. It was uh, very educative. Uh, okay. um, many nice uh, pictures, uh, easy to understand, uh, much better than bloody, uh, bloody equations and uh, high level thoughts. Uh, it was very good talk. Thank you very much. And I will close it uh, in a while. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.